one. Last off. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. We are a little late to our own party. Sorry about that. We had some technical trouble. Um, welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this abortion teaching. Um, we're calling it The Real History of Abortion, Old Action, New Struggle. Uh, my name is Julia. I use the pronouns she, her, and I'll be kicking things off tonight. I want to start off with a couple of basics. Uh, this presentation is being live streamed over YouTube and our participants faces are not visible to keep us safe from anyone who might be here in bad faith. To avoid disruption from these people, we've also disabled the comments. I'll provide contact information for anyone that wants to engage or get in touch with us at the end of the talk. Also, I should issue a content warning before we dive in. Tonight we'll be discussing pregnancy, childbirth, and abortion. These topics can be sensitive, so please make sure that you've got your headphones in, there's no sensitive ears around, and you're ready to go. Okay, so let's get started. For anyone that might be new here, a question. What is the DSA? DSA, or the Democratic Socialists of America, is a national political organization run democratically by its members. We seek to build and be part of a mass movement that transfers power from the ruling elite to the working class and gain freedom through democratic control over all aspects of our society. Another question, what is the socialist feminist working group of the DSA? As socialist feminists, we believe that the emancipation of women and non-binary people cannot be achieved by merely gaining power within the existing system. We reject feminism that is based on lifestyle choices and individual freedom at the expense of other people. Our goal is to bring a feminist lens to the work of DSA as a whole, and we provide opportunities for education and engagement around feminist issues in the Asheville community. I'll be calling it SOCFEM from here on out, just to make it easy. Uh, from SOCFEM, here with me tonight to present to you all are Aaron, Tessa, Emily, Jenny and Michelle, whose voices you'll be hearing throughout the next hour. Tonight, our goal is to show you that abortion is a very common and safe healthcare practice that has been outlawed and attacked in response to a decrease in the birth rate. While we often hear abortion framed as a moral or religious issue, we want to show that in a real and material way, the control over abortion is actually a means to force people to reproduce and maintain the population even in the face of poor economic conditions. We're going to get into the history of the abortion struggle and talk about how it's progressed over the last two centuries. We'll hear testimonies from radical women in the 60s on their experiences with abortion. And then we'll get into how the abortion struggle looks today and the real reasons behind that struggle. Before we dive in, I want to clarify an important point. Sometimes the material or statistics that we rely on for data will exclusively use the word women to speak about pregnancy and abortions. We know that it's more than just women who can get pregnant and also that some women can't. Part of the process of normalizing abortion and fighting for the freedom and access we want is making sure that literature and science catch up to terminology that uses terms like pregnant people instead of women. That is a long-term project. And meanwhile, we're unfortunately stuck with data that does not include all identities. We are always looking deeper for stories from historically marginalized people whose testimonies are difficult to access because they have been erased and overlooked by history um, from the, by the influence of the patriarchy and white supremacy. The history of abortion knowledge is an eternal work in progress. And so this presentation is an evolving one, changing with time to reflect more and more of the knowledge that we gather. So with all that out of the way, let's get into it. Uh, Tessa, one of my wonderful co-hosts this evening, will take it away from here. Thank you, Julia. All right. Abortion is usually defined as the intentional ending of a pregnancy or an induced miscarriage. This can be done medicinally by taking a pill or it can be done surgically. 
So who gets abortions? The current statistics show that approximately 30% of women will get one or more abortions in their lifetime. And as Julia was just saying, because the language in most of these studies has not yet caught up with us, we would like to clarify that not just women get abortions. Trans men, non-binary people, gender fluid, and gender non-conforming people can all get abortions. These can be parents, teenagers, college students, really anyone with a wanted or unwanted pregnancy. The truth is, abortion can be easy, accessible, and safe. It can be, and it should be. So why is it of utmost importance that we're talking about this now? While abortion has been legal for more than four decades, anti-abortion politicians have pushed safe legal abortion care out of reach for poor women, young people, and people of color. And that will only get worse if Roe versus Wade is overturned or weakened. While the topic we're focusing on is abortion, we want to point out that the overall fight is bigger than just abortion. It's about reproductive justice, and it's about gender justice. This also encompasses being against coercion, forced sterilizations, forced birth control, and coerced abortions. Throughout history, women of color have suffered the most from this lack of reproductive justice. So we want to highlight just a few of the reproductive struggles women of color have encountered and explore how this is still happening in the present day. First of all, enslaved black women were forced to have children in this country. Once the importation of enslaved people was banned in 1808, the only way to get more slaves or free labor was to have enslaved women give birth to them. If enslaved mothers did not bear sufficient numbers of children to take the place of aged and dying workers, the South could not continue as a slave society. So women were forced to have children and there were repercussions for barrenness. Young women who had not demonstrated fertility faced the possibility of separation from their family as well as additional labor. If a married couple lived together for long without having a baby, some planters, even right here in North Carolina, would force both husband and wife to choose new partners. It was reported that many marriages did not last longer than five years because if no children were born within that period, husbands and wives were expected to find other spouses. Another matter of reproductive injustice was the mass sterilization of Puerto Rican women by the U.S. Between the 1930s and 1970s, the U.S. government sterilized about one-third of the women in Puerto Rico because, allegedly, the island was overpopulated and the government wanted to control population and increase migration to mainland U.S. and, more relevant to us, to increase the number of women participating in the workforce, which in Puerto Rico meant low-paid textile jobs. Forced sterilizations, unethical trials of contraceptives, and other forms of government control of reproduction were commonplace among women of color in the U.S. And this continues to happen today. As recently as September of 2020, a nurse reported medical neglect and questionable hysterectomies of ICE detainees at an Immigration and Customs Enforcement facility in Georgia. Also, the fact that the United States has a higher than average maternal mortality rate has brought more attention to the way racism impacts healthcare today. We know that black mothers in the US die at three to four times the rate of white mothers, one of the widest racial disparities in women's health, and that even personal wealth does not protect black mothers from that very high risk. So why do socialists care about abortion? For those of you who don't know, socialism is when workers own the means of production and manage their own working conditions. So socialists are of course concerned with the way society organizes labor, the working people, and the economy. To be clear, having and raising children is work and it's a very important form of labor in our society. Reproductive labor and childcare are necessary to run a society and to send folks to work an often forgotten and underappreciated form of labor in our society. Restricting abortion and birth control means women have to do this labor whether or not they want to, and whether or not the conditions, i.e. healthcare, childcare, et cetera, are good. So when did people start getting abortions? People in the ancient world sought abortion just as we do today but the methods were often ineffective, dangerous, and or painful. 
The first recorded evidence of induced abortion is from an Egyptian papyrus in 1550 BC. Records from ancient China document the consumption of mercury to induce miscarriage. And people in Southeast Asian countries attempted abortion by massage. As for the Bible, it turns out the only mention of abortion in the Bible is how to perform one. Abortion may be referred to in the Bible in the book of Numbers, which refers to drinking a bitter water. It also says that life begins at birth, at the first breath. Although the Bible does not have much to say about abortion, early Christian scholars debated its morality, with some believing that abortion should not be permitted except in specific cases. Greek physician Hippocrates advocated for abortion by vigorous exercise. Aristotle wrote that the line between lawful and unlawful abortion will be marked by the fact of having sensation and being alive. And in ancient Rome, abortion was commonly accepted. Punishment for abortion in the Roman Republic was generally inflicted as a violation of the father's right to dispose of his offspring, not around the act of abortion itself. Although abortion was commonly accepted in Rome, around 211 CE, emperors banned abortion as infringing on parental rights. Abortion laws in England and Europe, which influenced those in the U.S., were based upon both common law and religious ideas. English common law permitted abortion until the time of quickening which is when movement of the fetus is noticeable and occurs sometime between 15 to 20 weeks into the pregnancy. We would like to point out that the sensation of quickening is really noticed and measured by the person who is pregnant, and thus the freedom to choose the timing of abortion was really up to that person listening to their own body and deciding when it was necessary. As long as women were themselves the reporters of the phenomenon of quickening, this meant that they were in practice and in principle in charge of whether the termination of pregnancy could be regulated. In England, um, which enacted legislation in 1803 to bar abortion after quickening on pain of death, the question of quickening became a crucial one. So much so that determinations of quickening were sometimes put to juries comprised of matrons with firsthand knowledge of the phenomenon. Under the influence of Christianity, but also as part of a campaign to strip midwives of their power and control over reproduction, some Western countries even began accusing midwives of being witches. In 1869, Pope Pius X decreed all abortion to be punished as murder. So what about in the U.S.? There was a time when abortion was simply part of life. People didn't scream about it in protests at abortion clinics and service. <clears throat> and abortions. I'm having some. There we go. Hi, Can Cecil. you hear me okay? All right. Thank you. Yes. All right. Um, and abortions were marketed openly. In the 18th century in the United States and until about 1880, abortions were allowed under common law and widely practiced. They were illegal only after quickening as we mentioned before, the highly subjective term used to describe when a pregnant person could feel the meat fetus moving. In the mid 19th century, drugs to induce abortions were a booming business. They were advertised in newspapers and could be bought from pharmacists from physicians and even through the mail. If drugs didn't work, women could visit practitioners for instrumental procedures. The earliest efforts to govern abortions centered on concerns about poisoning, not morality, religion, or even politics. Abortions are common and they always have been. Some late 19th century doctors believe that there were 2 million abortions occurring in the US each year. In 1904, a doctor estimated that in Chicago alone, six to 10,000 abortions were induced every year. As one physician remarked in 1911, those who apply for abortions are from every walk of life, from the factory girl to the millionaire's daughter, from the laborer's wife to that of the banker, no class, no sect seems to be above the destruction of the fetus. In the late 1920s, a study of 10,000 working class clients of Margaret Sanger's birth control clinics 
found that 20% of all pregnancies had been intentionally aborted. Surveys of educated middle-class women in the 1920s showed that 10 to 23% had had abortions. Anecdotal information, patient histories collected at maternity and birth control clinics, and mortality data show that women of every racial and religious group had abortions. A more comprehensive survey conducted by Regine Styx of almost 1,000 women who went to the birth control clinic in the Bronx in 1931 and 1932 found that 35% of the Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish clients alike had at least one illegal abortion. By the 1930s, Dr. Frederick Tostig, a nationally recognized authority on abortion, estimated that there were at least 681,000 abortions per year happening in the United States. So again, up until 1873, abortion was generally allowed in the US. It wasn't until the late 1850s that abortions began to be criminalized, except when necessary to save a woman's life. Surprisingly, that was not at the urging of social or religious conservatives, but under pressure from the medical establishment. The American Medical Association at the time began a crusade in 1857 to make abortion illegal. It was said that some of it came out of a physician's desire to win professional power, control medical practice, and restrict their competitors, namely midwives and homeopaths. It wasn't until abortion began to become politicized in this country in 1869 that the Catholic Church came out and condemned abortion. In 1895, the Catholic Church even condemned therapeutic abortion, meaning procedures to save a woman's life. The American Medical Association pushed for state laws to restrict abortions, and most did by 1880. On March 3rd, 1873, Congress passed a new law, later known as the Comstock Act. The statute defined contraceptives as obscene and illicit, making it a federal offense to disseminate birth control through the mail or across state lines. The law also banned important safety items, including abortion drugs. Through the 1960s, abortion was banned in much of the US, due in part to lobbying by the American Medical Association. Um, we will highlight the fight and the struggle of women for reproductive justice in the 1960s and 70s in just a moment here on the next slide. <clears throat> but back to the timeline. Abortion wasn't such a political and divisive issue that long ago. In 1969, Republicans led Democrats by 10% in their support for legalized abortion in the first trimester. Then finally, in 1973, the Roe v. Wade case was a landmark decision of the US Supreme Court in which the court ruled that the Constitution of the United States protects a pregnant woman's liberty to choose to have an abortion without excessive government restriction. In its ruling, the court recognized for the first time that the constitutional right to privacy is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. Roe has come to be known as the case that legalized abortion nationwide. Since 1973, when Roe versus Wade um, was approved across the United States, states have enacted more than 1,000 laws to limit access to the procedure. More than a quarter of these laws were passed not that long ago, between 2010 and 2015. And so flash forward to more recent times, in 2019, 61% of adults in the US believe that abortion should be legal in all or most cases, but it is still more of a struggle to obtain a safe and legal abortion than ever. Then back to the 1960s and 70s. In this time, radical feminist groups were working hard and agitating for abortion rights. In February of 1969, Red Stockings members disrupted a New York legislative hearing about abortion. The New York Joint Legislative Committee on the Problems of Public Health had called the hearing to consider reforms to the New York law, then 86 years old, on abortion. They condemned the hearing because the experts were a dozen men and a Catholic nun. Of all women to speak, they thought a nun would be the least likely to have contended with the abortion issue, other than from perhaps her religious bias. The Red Stockings members shouted and called for the legislators to hear from women who had actually had abortions. Eventually, that hearing had to be moved to another room behind closed doors. 
In August of 1970, the women's strike for equality occurred. 40,000 women marched in New York City and feminist demands spread out broadly throughout the left. In 1973, Supreme Court used the New York law that these women fought for as a model for Roe versus Wade. To celebrate the actions of these radical women then, and to give you context on what the experience of getting and seeking an abortion was like back then, we've collected some testimonies that we would like to share with you now. The following quotes are from an abortion speak out in which these radical women stormed a hearing overseen by men and one nun and spoke out about their experiences because women are the actual experts. This is Helen recalling her first abortion at 18 years old. When I got pregnant, I was so terrified. And I remember going to Woolworth and buying a ring so I could go to the hospital and say I was married. You had to be married to get a pregnancy test. I had a couple of best friends, but I didn't tell them about it because I was so ashamed and terrified, absolutely terrified, like my life had come to an end and I didn't know what to do. And finally, I found somebody who knew somebody where the Wisconsin girls went. And I went with a friend to this man in Chicago in a boarded up old building. He's talking about giving drugs to Lenny Bruce and how he liked the girls from Wisconsin. And he gave discounts to college girls. And I was absolutely terrified. And then he put his head down and he fell asleep in the middle of this. And he put some kind of a thing inside me and he said, you're going to walk around all day long. And when you start to bleed, come back. I had a real feeling that I could die. I mean, I knew that I was in the hands of some kind of quack, but I was so terrified that it was all right. I really had accepted that I could die. I remember when I told my mother that I was pregnant and wanted an abortion, she fainted. She thought I was going to die. And she wasn't so far from the truth because many people did die when they had abortions. I remember going to the doctor's offices and being turned away. Doctors telling me, get out of here. I don't want to hear the word. I don't want to see you. And running around Manhattan trying to find someone who would talk to me, being terrified. We'd make appointments to go to the abortionist, and I'd wait. I'd wait some more. Finally, at five o'clock, if the appointment was at one, I realized he's not going to come. And finally, I realized the point was everything was set up to make me get married and have a child. I was terrified when my grandmother called me to tell me she had seen me in the New York Times. She said, dearie, you only had one abortion. Let me tell you, I had 13. She then proceeded to tell me about the Russian and Italian midwives of Manhattan's Lower East Side and how skilled they were. They not only did abortions, but visited you afterwards to make sure all was well, brought you some soup and let you pay in installments. Well, my consciousness was raised. Now that we've covered an overview of the history of abortion and abortion bans in the US, the how, let's delve deeper into the question of why. Whether you were raised to believe in reproductive freedom or taught that abortion is wrong, you were probably told that the reason abortion rights were under attack was because religious groups oppose abortion. However, one purpose of our talk today is to show that moral opposition is not the main driver in attacks on abortion rights. Remember, historically, most Christians approved of abortion until quickening. Instead, most attacks on abortion rights have been driven by material concerns. What do we mean by material concerns? Let's first take a look at two types of labor that capitalism exploits. You probably know that capitalists who are the big bosses who own and control resources exploit workers by underpaying them and accumulating profit. We call the work done by these workers of producing goods and services having monetary value productive labor. Additionally, Marxist feminists recognize that capitalism also depends on the domestic labor of women and other caregivers, many of whom work for free. We call this work reproductive labor, and it includes things like cooking, 
cleaning, having and raising children, and caring for the elderly. Without reproductive labor, there will be no more productive labor because there would be no next generation of workers born. Capitalism exploits both types of labor and workers of both types find ways to fight back against this exploitation. When workers are unsatisfied with their work conditions, they can join a union or go on strike. When reproductive laborers are unsatisfied with their work conditions, they can refuse to do the labor of cooking, cleaning, and having children. It's this latter point that we're focusing on today. How does this relate to abortion? First, it's a problem for capitalists when either kind of worker decides to strike. Bosses and owners want workers to go back to the factory or office and caregivers to have and care for children. They want more money, which means they need more power over workers' lives. In the case of childbirth, they want to be able to force people to have children. Second, fewer people having children leads to declining populations. Declining populations are a problem for capitalists because they want a large labor pool. If there are more workers, there's more competition for jobs, which drives down the cost of labor. It also increases the number of potential customers. One Forbes.com article explains that, quote, with shrinking supply of labor, firms will sometimes shut down. But population growth means steady flows of new customers, whereas closing firms happen only occasionally, end quote. Population growth also contributes to GDP growth. According to capitalist economics, a nation's economy must grow every year by sufficient percentages or else the system enters a recession or depression. One way to facilitate this growth is to ensure an ever-growing workforce and consumer base. So it's in the interest of capitalism to ensure that the population continues to grow. And the capitalist class recognizes this. One Bloomberg, or, or Bloomberg article laments the population decline in wealthy countries with the headline, a world with fewer babies spells economic trouble. And a recent Market Watch article warned that, quote, America's declining birth rate is a warning sign for millions of people's finances, end quote. This effect is compounded by the fact that U.S. birth rates declined in response to the Great Recession and will likely decline further following future recessions. The system has long relied on reproductive labor. As scholar Helen Matthews Lewis wrote, women's labor is used as a safety valve to maintain the economic system through cycles of inflation and depression. Social programs can be cut, she said, because women are back home in the informal, non-economic economy, feeding and maintaining family members, end quote. As we'll see, while of course many people want to have families and do so despite poor conditions, many other people find it too difficult to raise children in our society and have decided not to. Since capitalism relies on this free labor, it sees this as a problem. So what's the cheapest way to increase birth rates? Restrict access to contraception and abortion. Now, let's take a closer look at this decline in the birth rates and some of the reasons for it. <clears throat> this slide shows a graph of birth rates in the U.S. from 1800 to 2020. Capitalists want the birth rate to be above replacement level, which is usually calculated around 2.1 or 2.3 children per, per pair of adults. Attacks on abortion follow declines in birth rates. As you can see in this chart, birth rates in the U.S. have overall declined steadily since the 1800s. The exception came during the baby boom period from 1940 to 1960. And you might remember that during the baby boom, there was widespread support, support for abortion rights, at least in the first trimester of pregnancy. As Tessa mentioned earlier, in the 1800s, the, leaning, the leading opponents of abortion were not clergy, but medical doctors. Doctors supported abortion bans because they wanted to put midwives out of business and in some cases, because they perceived the population decline and blamed it on abortion. Physician Horatio Storer brought this to the attention of U.S. politicians around the year 1870 when he published an article titled, On the Decrease of the Rate of Increase of Population Now Obtaining in Europe and America, which blamed the slowing of population growth on abortions. Politicians began proposing abortion bans because birth rates were declining, starting with the Comstock Act in 1873. 
since 1960, birth rates in this country have resumed this decline, after which in the 1970s, abortion became a key political issue. Reagan ran for president on an anti-abortion platform in 1980, despite passing the nation's most liberal abortion law earlier as governor of California. What changed in the 70s and 80s? Look at the graph. Birth rates were declining and even dipping below replacement level, which meant that the overall population was going to start to shrink unless someone intervened. Conservatives will tell you that abortion became a political issue because of Roe v. Wade, but politicians were likely scared of what corporations would say about declining populations. Additionally, right-wing religious activists suddenly became interested in abortion because it was a convenient rallying cry which let them form a coalition for the purpose of upholding segregation. As we can see, the downward trend in birth rates continues today, and bans have followed. According to the Guttmacher Institute, in 2019, conservative state legislators raced to enact an unprecedented wave of bans on all, most, or some abortions. And by the end of the year, 25 new abortion bans had been signed into law. Today, despite early predictions of a COVID baby boom, current data show that the U.S. would see as many as 500,000 fewer births in 2021. So we can expect more attempted abortion bans to come. The reasons for this decline in birth rates are important to us because a lot of these reasons relate to things that socialists want and capitalist politicians aren't willing to give. First though, some of the reasons for the decline are neutral or, or even positive. One positive reason for the declining birth rates is that infant and child mortality are lower. Sadly, in the past, people had more children expecting many of them not to live to adulthood. But overall, it's safer for both mothers and children in 2020 than it was in 1820. <clears throat> Another positive reason is that people today have better access to safe, legal abortion and birth control. The birth control methods available today are more reliable and abortion is safer than it was before Roe v. Wade. Additionally, we'll call this a neutral reason, more women are entering the workforce and being educated, which leads to having children later, resulting in fewer children born per person. Next, we'll take a look at some of the negative reasons why birth rates have been declining. <clears throat> in fact, most of the reasons for today's decline in birth rates are negative. First, many people in the US have very poor health care. You often hear that US health care is the best in the world, but that's only true for the wealthy. The reality is that almost 30 million Americans were uninsured in 2018, a number that's almost certainly gone up with job losses due to COVID-19. The CDC reports that in 2018, more than 40% of births were paid for by Medicaid. For people who don't qualify for Medicaid, the average cost to have a baby in the U.S. without complications during delivery is over $10,000, which can increase to $30,000 or more when factoring in care provided before and after pregnancy. Second, <clears throat> the vast majority of people in the U.S. don't have paid parental leave. A 2019 report by UNICEF, which analyzed legally protected leave for new parents in 41 of the world's richest countries found that 40 of those 41 countries had paid leave for new mothers, and 26 offered paid paternity leave. Only the United States provides neither. Three, it's still dangerous to give birth. Although infant and maternal mortality rates have declined overall, the U.S. leads the developed world in maternal and infant mortality. One NIH study reports that, quote, legal induced abortion is markedly safer than childbirth. The risk of death associated with childbirth is approximately 14 times higher than that with abortion. <clears throat> Finally, here's one more reason for the decline in birth rates in the US, the serious lack of affordable childcare programs. Most people who raise children will raise them in a household where either both parents work or where the main caregiver is a single parent who works. Thus, the cost of childcare is an important factor people weigh when deciding whether to have children. According to one survey, more than half of families report that they spend at least $10,000 per year on childcare, which is more than the average annual cost of in-state college tuition. 
The average weekly daycare cost for one infant child is $215. To compare, someone who makes the federal minimum wage, which hasn't increased in a decade, takes home about $250 per week. So you can see why, as one of the graphs on this slide indicates, the percentage of stay-at-home mothers has risen. For many people, it simply isn't cost-effective to work only to barely cover the cost of childcare. And women bear the brunt of this responsibility, as you can see in the graph on the right. Worse yet, the quality of childcare is often so low that children are put in dangerous conditions, sometimes with fatal consequences. Under these conditions, it is understandable that some people choose to use birth control and have abortions because they can't afford to have children. Our point is this. Abortion is not fundamentally a cultural issue. It's an economic issue. As we've seen, there are a number of reasons why people might choose not to have children even if they would like to. Unsurprisingly, based on what we've learned, child and parent poverty in the US is quadrupled out of other rich countries. Under these conditions, many people have decided that it's too hard to have kids, that they can't afford it, or there's just no way to make it work. Since so many people decided not to have kids or stopped at one, the U.S. birth rate has fallen below replacement level. Remember, the U.S. forces people to reproduce so capitalists are happy and profits can grow. The power structure in the United States might have been willing to accommodate our demands for abortion rights when birth rates were high, but as birth rates have dropped, they started chipping away at reproductive rights to ensure a growing labor pool. If conservative activists and politicians were serious about reducing abortion, they could push to improve the conditions of childbirth and child rearing, ensuring that parents and children are healthy and well cared for. In other wealthy countries, governments encourage people to reproduce by offering generous welfare policies. But rather than mandating paid leave, universal childcare, or universal health care, many capitalist politicians in the US prefer to simply make abortion illegal. It's not fair that the state makes it so difficult for many people to have and raise children. And that's why we fight in the short term for Medicare for all, paid leave, and free childcare. And in the long term, for worker control. We believe that having children should be safe and affordable for all people. We also believe that people should have children because they want to experience the joys of parenthood, not because they're forced to do reproductive labor by the capitalist state. You, if you are able to do so, should be free to choose whether or not you carry and give birth to a child. But the capitalist system in this country wants to force you to have a child, even though it may be dangerous or require a large sacrifice from you. If instead we had complete reproductive freedom, we'd be free to demand better conditions or refuse the labor. Now, let's take a look at some common unhelpful arguments often made in favor of abortion rights. Maybe you've made some of these arguments in the past, that's okay. We'll talk about why these aren't as effective as they could be, and based on what we've learned, things you can say instead. Unhelpful argument number one, abortion is about individual choice. Yes, abortion is about an individual's choice, but this isn't a very effective argument. It removes abortion from the political realm and makes it personal. But as a second wave feminist said, the personal is political. The word choice or pro-choice can sound like a euphemism. Besides, anti-abortion people find this argument very easy to refute. We should say that we are pro-abortion. Whether or not you personally would have an abortion or might prefer not to, we still encourage you to use this term because the right to have an abortion is fundamentally about the right to control your own body, and it's serious and important, and we should say the words. At least as a start, you can say that you are pro-abortion rights. In the end, we need to say what we really mean. Abortion and birth control constitute people's collective right to refuse to do reproductive labor in the face of bad reproductive working conditions like lack of affordable childcare, healthcare, and paid leave. Unhelpful argument number two, abortion is not birth control, or that this is like the argument that abortion should be, quote, safe, legal, and rare. This makes abortion seem scary and dangerous. <clears throat> In fact, 
as we have learned today, abortion is a safe and common procedure, and there's no reason to try to make it less common. No birth control method is 100% effective, so abortion is sometimes necessary even for people who use contraception. Throughout history, abortion and birth control have been restricted and freed together. And for women's freedom, abortion and birth control have the same result, namely preventing or ending an unwanted pregnancy. So we should emphasize that both abortion and birth control should be freely accessible to all. <clears throat> Unhelpful argument number three, abortion is a matter between a woman and her doctor. Many women don't have doctors or received poor treatment from doctors, including those who were sterilized against their will. And as we learned, doctors sometimes have their own agendas, remember Mr. Storer from earlier. The decision to have an abortion should belong to the pregnant person alone, who has the right to decide what happens to their body. Unhelpful argument number four, abortion is our right to privacy. This is the Roe v. Wade argument, and it's easily refutable. You don't have a right to do anything just as long as it's private. And it makes abortion seem shameful. In fact, feminists often find that it's necessary to break the taboo about abortion by talking about abortions they've had. We should open up about abortion and encourage others to talk about it. <clears throat> Unhelpful argument number five, abortion saves people from having disabled babies. If our society were willing to provide disabled people with the care and resources they need, then having a disabled child might not be as frightening as it can be for some folks today. As socialists, we believe that people's lives have value and meaning beyond just what they can contribute to the economy. So, we should fight for better care and social services for all people, including disabled people. And finally, unhelpful argument number six, abortion is not political. Actually, abortion is political because it's about power and who has the power to control women's and other birthing people's bodies. We should emphasize this like we're trying to do today by talking about how abortion involves the power struggle between the capitalist state and people over their own bodies. We demand the right to an abortion without interference. We demand Medicare for all to cover the cost of abortion, birth control, and childbirth. We demand paid leave, affordable childcare, and the right to have or refuse to have children. And we must unite together to fight back and demand control over our bodies. Hell yeah, Erin. Thank you so much for breaking those arguments down for us. Um, this is Julia again. And now I want to get into some important events that have happened recently that show how politicizing abortion is an effective tool to gaining abortion freedom and winning more power for all people. Up first on the left here, um, on December 31st, 2020, Argentina's Senate voted to legalize abortion a huge vote in a conservative country and a victory that was completely dependent on a grassroots movement led by people and not politicians that turned years of rallies into political power. The activists involved were able to create a network of allies that they can now count on to push for more change in the future. In Poland, the religious government's attempts to limit abortion to fewer and fewer exceptions have been a catalyst for a countrywide strike inspired by one that took place in Iceland in 1975. Demonstrations led by regular people, again, not politicians, were held throughout the country, creating new cross-generational alliances and radicalizing people that may have otherwise been considered unpolitical. Movements and struggles like these are contagious. When people take to the streets to confront governments and regimes, and we sustain that pressure, eventually we win the things we are demanding. We can learn from these movements as we prepare for our own fights. In our own country, access to abortion is being whittled away, especially since 2010, when a wave of conservative Republicans elected to state office began implementing a hard right pro-life agenda. Abortion rights opponents are feeling very optimistic with three of Trump's conservative nominees now sitting on the Supreme Court. Joe Biden, has flip-flopped on his support of Roe versus Wade, the Hyde Amendment. And in 2006, in an interview, he said, quote, I do not view abortion as a choice and a right. 
I think it's always a tragedy, unquote. As socialist feminists, we do not believe that Joe Biden, a capitalist and a devout Catholic, will be doing much to protect the rights of the people who can get pregnant. The points of view of our politicians are not in line with public opinion and go against the trend of more and more regular people calling for more access to abortion. Public support for abortion to protect the health of the mother or in cases of birth defect or rape has topped 70% since the late 1970s and support for legal abortion for any reason a person wants is now at 49%, up from 40% during the early 2000s. With those numbers, it's easy to see that what politicians and capitalists do differs dramatically from what the people want. We find ourselves in an important moment of both increased awareness and support for abortion rights and opposition to and movements from politicians to restrict abortion rights as much as humanly possible. So what to do? Well, for starters, it's important to normalize abortion. We need to talk about our experiences and to share information and resources with our communities. Shout Your Abortion, for example, is a platform that works to normalize abortion through art and media and personal testimonies. Plan C is a website that provides information about how to access abortion pills in all 50 states. These are resources that absolutely everybody should know about. Medicare for All, which is a topic that calls for its own presentation, is a popular and dynamic fight that critically needs the voices and activism of feminists to ensure that abortion be treated like the safe and common healthcare procedure that it is. Abortion funds are a network of local autonomous organizations that are funding abortion and building power to fight for cultural and political change. They help people navigate barriers in addition to paying for procedures. The National Network of Abortion Funds forms a network of over 80 grassroots organizations that directly supported 56,000 people in 2019. Our local abortion fund, the Carolina Abortion Fund, was started by a group of clinic defenders who were tired of seeing patients delaying or canceling their appointments because they couldn't afford them. They operate a conf confidential toll-free helpline that provides financial, practical, and emotional support to callers in North and South Carolina trying to access abortion care. Abortion funds are frontline responders to people seeking abortion support, both financial and otherwise. It's up to us to support them, definitely financially, but also by making them household names that all people know and recognize. By supporting the National Network of Abortion Funds, we build power that centers the people who have abortions and that comes from the people most involved in the struggle and thus the experts on what needs to be done. The most important thing we can do is get together and organize as the examples of Argentina and Poland go to show. Change is made by, making, change is made by people who show up. The sooner you join up with a feminist group, the sooner you begin to build trust with like-minded radical people and lend your skills, power, and expertise to a people's movement. Our goal is for the right for anyone to have an abortion without any interference. Free abortion, on demand, without apology. We must push this goal further. The cost of abortion, birth control, and childbirth should be shared by us all since we all benefit from the work of reproductive labor. We must demand paid leave, affordable childcare, and the right to have or refuse to have children. Those are the ways that we will win true freedom. We have really big dreams, but these dreams don't have a chance of becoming a reality until we get together and build a strong coalition of regular people who are feminists and activists, people care, and people who are ready to do the work. So after that big rallying cry, um, now let me tell you about the inspiration for tonight's talk. Um, this is a book called Without Apology, the Abortion, uh, the Abortion Struggle Now by Jenny Brown. If you're not familiar, this is a short and powerful book that really breaks down the ideology behind the opposition to abortion and outlines ways that we can strengthen our struggle in the future. There are many things covered in this book that we didn't have time to dig into, including lessons from the radicals of the Red Stockings, the Army of Three, and the Jane Collective. Jenny Brown puts together a roadmap for today's organizers from the black feminist argument for reproductive justice, 
to the successful fight to make the morning after pill available over the counter, to the recent mass movement to repeal Ireland's abortion ban. Jenny Brown emphasizes the fundamental ideas that won legal abortion in the first place. People publicly telling the truth of their own experience, demanding repeal of all abortion restrictions, and showing how abortion and birth control are the key demands in the struggle for reproductive freedom. We read Without Apology as part of our SOCFEM reading group, and the discussions that we had and the lessons that we learned inspired this presentation and radicalized our thinking about abortion. We collectively felt a lot of light bulbs going off and understanding falling into place. So if you're interested, go get yourself a copy. Firestorm sells them. And there's a link to that up on the slide. And that's it. Thank you all so much for attending and participating this evening. We hope that you'll come away with a new perspective on the fight for abortion rights and reproductive freedom, as well as some new tools on how to talk to others about the issue. Because of our privacy considerations for tonight, we weren't able to incorporate any kind of Q&A. So if you have any questions or you just wanna talk about this topic more, please reach out to us. The email is on the slide and we welcome your feedback and engagement. Our SOCFAM group is regularly doing readings uh, to help expand our understanding and analysis of the current conditions we are confronting and the types of solutions that socialist feminists must be fighting for. We're helping people get plugged into patient greeting at Planned Parenthood, raising money for the Carolina Abortion Fund, exposing the crisis pregnancy centers in Asheville, and generally building a community of people who are passionate about feminist issues and excited about pushing for change. If you're interested in getting involved with the DSA and the SOCFEM working group, we've put a link on the slide above that has information on some of our upcoming meetings, along with a general email sign up to stay abreast of what we're doing on a monthly basis. We look forward to seeing you soon and send you a big, huge thank you for coming out tonight and listening to this teach-in. Have a great